Tuesday, the 21st of February, 2017. For Texan friends visiting Australia. I think it was a trip of a lifetime. And an old school pilot. People had so much respect for him. On a routine flight. To them, it just seemed like a quick hop over there. But becomes 10 seconds of terror. I jumped out of the car. And a split second later, there was a loud crash. That ends in a fireball at a bustling shopping centre. I deployed crews to search for the general public. Just metres from a busy freeway. Is there anyone alive and can we get to them? We take you into the laboratories, uncovering the truth. The pilot issued a mayday call seven times in rapid succession. In first-hand reports, we break down the days. I couldn't work out whether it was an accident or an attack. The hours. Like a bomb. And the minutes leading up to the disaster. Terrorism. It could have been. Which shocked Melbourne. What a terrifying way to die. And destroyed lives across the globe. It was heart-wrenching for me. It was hard. True stories told by the people who were there. Melbourne is Australia's prosperous second largest city. Known for its culture, its passion for sport, and its unpredictable weather. Melbourne is, is a village in a way, and it's one of the things I love about Melbourne. It's about an honesty and openness of heart. The community spirit, the pride we have in being Melburnians. And most of us come from such diverse backgrounds and so it is an open city. I think Melbourne celebrates well and Melbourne mourns well too. My name is John Salvano. I've been a priest in Melbourne for nearly 40 years. The day began as any other day. I, I would get up, have a shower, um, shave, pray, or may have had mass even before breakfast. I usually start head to work about 5.30 in the morning. On that day, it's like a beautiful day coming on. There was um, certainly only a few clouds around, but it was a lovely blue sky for our beautiful city we live in. So my name's Craig Williams. I'd been in the fire brigade for 30 years. I remember the morning of the incident very clearly. Um, it was uh, a sunny morning. I'd just left a meeting at our headquarters in the city. I was on my way back to my office out in Western Melbourne. Melbourne suburbs extend to almost 10,000 square kilometres and include Essendon Fields, just 11 kilometres from the city centre. It's the home of Essendon Airport, which until the 1970s was the city's main international arrival point. Essendon Fields is also home to one of Melbourne's most popular shopping malls, the Direct Factory Outlet, or DFO, which sits right at the end of the airport runway. I'm Ashley James Mayer. I was working at the DFO at the time of the fire. I worked for the good guys. Uh, my role was the warehouse coordinator position. So I woke up uh, a little bit late, actually. It was uh, in a bit of a hurry. Um, I didn't drive at the time, so I got myself an Uber uh, and got my way over to work. My name is Heather Stockton. My role is a Fire Rescue Victoria, Fire Service Communications Controller. I was on duty on that Tuesday morning. Visiting Melbourne that day were four adventurous Texan friends travelling with their wives on an extended golfing holiday to New Zealand and Australia. My name is Danelle Wick. I live in Minnesota and I am the sister to Greg DeHaven who was killed in the Melbourne plane crash. My brother started golfing when he was in high school, I believe it was. 
It became a great passion as he got older. When Greg retired from his job as an agent with the FBI, a new era of his life began. After he retired, and he met this lovely, lovely woman who he married, and that changed everything. He was so happy. Making the most of their retirement, Greg and Rosemary set off with their six closest friends, three couples, to play golf all over Australia. The interesting thing about all four of them, they all have very similar backgrounds. They all grew up very athletic. They all worked darn hard. And no wonder they worked so well as golfing together as a foursome. <laughs> they were all so much alike. There was John, a lawyer, who taught himself to golf at the age of 10 and attended college on a golf scholarship. And then there was Glenn, who was a clean air executive, who was also a philanthropist and had been competitively golfing for many years. And then there was Russ, who founded his own law firm, and he was also a musician. And these guys being so happy to do all this golfing, and the key was to make sure they were going to all these different courses. I think it was absolutely a trip of a lifetime. All right. The four friends and their wives spent the first part of their trip in New Zealand playing the prestigious Tara Iti and Cape Kidnappers courses. Once in Victoria, the four men played the acclaimed Royal Melbourne course, only days before making the last minute decision to go on a day trip to King Island for even more golf. They would charter a small twin engine plane for the 45 minute direct flight from Essendon Airport. Of course, to them, it just seemed like, you know, a quick hop over there and, and they were going to golf for the day and then fly back and meet up with their wives. The four friends booked experienced pilot Max Quartermain and a Beechcraft King Air for their day trip to King Island. For many years, the charter business was Max Quartermain's bread and butter and the business was good. We turn over around $10,000 a week in, in charter. But more recently, Max and the business had fallen on hard times. Hi, my name's Scylla Quartermain. I'm the widow of Max Quartermain. He started flying when he was 25. Flying was Max's life and his passion. He used to charter all these people around Australia. Fishing people, golf people, the media. People had so much respect for him. I was very proud of him. When you are trying to survive on just charters, it's very, very difficult. And, you know, the maintenance on the aircraft, fuel. I didn't know how we were going to survive in our later years. We'd lost our home. I took up ironing and washing to help uh, and I'm legally blind so it but I got through it. The couple's financial fears were made more difficult by a downturn in Max's health. He had a major heart operation he never got back to himself. He never had the energy. It was amazing, the difference. He was being very forgetful. He would say, you know, what's happening to me? I can't remember this, I can't remember that. I believe he became depressed. He just gave up. We found a job bus driving to the city and back. He did that for one day. But unfortunately, he left the handbrake and it rolled across the road and it was damaged. So that was the end of that, <laughs> which destroyed him a bit because he said, you know, what else can I do? I only know flying and who's going to want someone at 69 years of age? To get back in the air, Max had to undergo a flight test overseen by the Civil Aviation Safety Authority or CASA. 
Well, six weeks after Max's heart surgery, he was passed medically fit by CASA and I was gobsmacked. Couldn't believe that they would pass him medically fit and put him in the air the way he was. It was heart-wrenching for me because he would want to fly because we had hardly any work apart from this flight to King Island. The night before the accident, he was up all night checking the weather. He didn't sleep. He was so anxious and scared. He just did not feel confident in his abilities anymore. I just said to him, you know, please, just give it up. He's, he's, he was so proud. Max was also very proud of the twin-engine Beechcraft King Air he flew, the workhorse of the small charter industry. King Air aeroplanes are uh, very popular. They're very reliable, very safe. Nothing wrong with them at all. I would say they're just a little heavier on the controls, but they're solid, safe, very reliable, easy to fly. As a very tired Max Quatermain prepares his plane for the day's flight to King Island, he is about to make a series of mistakes that will cost five lives and ruin many more. Across town, four mad keen golfers, all the way from Texas, are making their way to Essendon Airport in peak hour traffic, excited about their day trip to King Island. In Canberra, at the ATSB, Derek Hofmeister and his team are preparing for an ordinary day. I was on the on-call roster, so I was part of the, the GO team. The ATSB stands for the Australian Transport Safety Bureau and their role is to improve safety through thorough accident investigation and sharing safety information. CCTV footage showed the pilot arriving at the aircraft around 7 o'clock in the morning. The pilot was observed to walk around the aircraft consistent with doing a pre-flight inspection. Followed by the pilot entering the aircraft and starting the engines and taxiing to the passenger terminal. Meanwhile, workers start heading to the Essendon DFO shopping centre, situated at the end of the airport's runways. Soon the popular factory outlet mall will be filled with customers as well, most of them travelling down peak hour Tullamarine Freeway, right next to the DFO. Like delivery coordinator Ashley Mayer. I didn't drive at the time, so I got myself an Uber uh, and got my way over to work. So, yeah, we were coming up in the Uber. It was quite a nice day, actually, nice and sunny. It was starting to warm up in the early morning because we were there to open up. Well, my name is Peter Scullin. I was driving my car, leaving the Tullamarine Freeway when this accident happened. 
Early that morning, uh, we'd left our holiday house in Glen Lyon. My wife and I had taken in turns to drive the car. So on, on that day, we did a changeover for the firefighters on shift. They do that at 8 o'clock in the morning, make sure we've got people in places, firefighters on trucks, to be able to respond to um, any type of emergency. At the terminal, the aircraft was refuelled. The CCTV footage showed the passengers arriving. The passengers boarded the aircraft, followed by the pilot. The footage then shows the cabin door closing and the engine starting. He should have then briefed the passengers on all the emergency things like life jackets, like emergency evacuation. When he gets in the pilot seat and he straps in, he then goes through the before start checklist. He then gets all the avionics up and running and verifies everything is correct and programs the flight management system GPS. And the aircraft commenced taxiing to the runway for takeoff. He would then call for taxi clearance from Essendon Tower and they would taxi up at the northern end of the runway. As pilot Max Quartermain prepares for takeoff, his American passengers have no idea that less than two years earlier, the man in control of their safety and their lives almost had a mid-air collision. In 2015, there was a serious incident where uh, Mr Quartermain was involved in a very uh, close near miss in very bad weather going into Mount Hotham with passengers on board. Two colleagues of mine were flying in other airplanes at the time and they were listening and they feared for the worst. And then he appeared nearly skimming the trees and landing. Max Quartermain came within two nautical miles, mere seconds of colliding with another plane. He was nearly wheels in the trees, according to observers. That's how, how scary it was and how close he came to killing himself and the people on board. But Max Quartermain needed to keep flying. And now with four golfing buddies from America on board, he's taxiing towards Essendon's main runway. They have only minutes to live. It's another busy workday in Melbourne. And a twin-engine Beechcraft King Air with pilot Max Quartermain and four passengers from the US has just been given clearance to take off. As always, Right next to the airport, at this time of day, the Tullamarine Freeway is buzzing with peak hour traffic. Yeah, we are coming up in the Uber, just having general chat as you do with a driver, you know, how's the day going, how's your work going? We were just coming up over the, off the off ramp, which is a bit of an incline, so you get kind of just a little bit of a view over the top of the signs there. So we enter the off ramp from the Tullamarine Freeway, which goes into Essendon and onto Melbourne. In the plane heading towards the freeway, there's no turning back. From the moment the wheels leave the ground, Max and his four passengers have only 10 seconds before the aircraft is destroyed in a massive fireball.
There was a loud crash, loud smash, or bang, a car shook, and then saw the ball of fire coming up over the top. Kind of looked at each other, just like, what the hell was that? There was a massive explosion, a huge yellow ball of flame inside the car, my wife, and I could feel the intense heat from the explosion. It was like something from a Hollywood movie. It took up the entire wall of the DFO. I couldn't work out whether it was an accident or an, an attack. When it happened, we, we both kind of jumped and freaked a little bit. I jumped out of the car just out the front there and went running around the building, thinking that it's a parking area. And they normally have some cylinders of gas or something. You know, sometimes kids go back there to smoke and stuff like that, so maybe something like that had blown up. We're getting multiple calls. People are reporting that the side of Spotlight is on fire. There's massive fireballs being seen and smoke is covering the freeway. As soon as Heather got, um, rang me and said there'd been 40 phone calls, I responded um, with lights and sirens along the Tullamarine freeway. I stopped the car and got out because the heat was so intense. There was a really strong smell of burning fuel. Some of the debris from the plane had flown into the air. We were just so close to where it happened. Workers rushed towards the molten inferno. Is that an airplane? Oh. Barely able to make out what is actually incinerating. First it was just, holy crap, that's... I think that's a plane. Is there anyone alive and can we get to them? There was a major rebuild of the CityLink Tullamarine Freeway and the traffic was bedlam through there. It was bumper to bumper. There was no emergency lanes for fire trucks or ambulances or police to get to incidents. But we were dispatching a lot of trucks to it. A lot of them got bogged down into the heavy traffic load. Saw one or two guys from uh, GB over there. Everyone went into a mad panic. One of the guys had a fire extinguisher, but it was pretty obvious that that was not going to do anything. Just can't show it the top. Looking at it and seeing, feeling the heat off the fire, there was just nothing we could do. So we were out of our stations in well under 90 seconds and on scene within minutes of the call. So we had about 30 fire trucks responding to the event. When the first fire trucks tear through the gaps in the peak hour traffic, they arrive to discover a nightmare. The question as to, you know, around terrorism, I knew that it wasn't a significant plane in terms of the size. I didn't suspect that would be a target, but it could have been. I deployed firefighting crews into the spotlight building in breathing apparatus with hose lines to search for workers in the buildings, general public potentially shopping. With so much carnage, nobody knows how many people may have been at the crash site at the time and how many people may have died. A light plane has inexplicably crashed headlong into a neighbourhood shopping mall. The aircraft itself was unrecognisable to me as an aircraft. The firefighters, they turn up not knowing what's going to confront them. They don't know whether there's five people in there or 20 people in there. What I was looking at, a plane down into a building, into a busy shopping area. You know, if you had it the right day of the week at the right time, thousands of people at that site. Uh, a lot of the fuel burnt on impact, which created a, a large fireball. The fire continued to burn and consume the plane, and obviously the building itself started to burn. With the plane a molten wreck, firefighters raced to rescue anybody trapped in the mall. 
as eyewitnesses watch the horror unfold. Most of the stores open up around about 10 o'clock at the DFO. So there would have been staff members in the building who had no clue anything was about to happen, going about their day and uh, getting ready for their shift. So initially there was a car on fire that was parked next to the factory, exactly where the wall was taken out by the plane. And there were unconfirmed reports of people missing. We weren't sure if there were people in the car. It wouldn't be any more than 100 metres from where our car was to where the plane hit the side of the DFO. So I like to think that he actually maybe uh, made an incredibly brave decision and decided to crash into the DFO by bringing the plane down quicker rather than extending on and finishing up with the plane on the freeway. And we were the fortunate ones who just luckily escaped. Peter and his wife aren't the only ones who have had a horrifyingly close call. Firefighting crews, they made sure everyone was out of the buildings, done full searches of those buildings and they evacuated them. Everyone was out. But as the firefighters continue to battle the furious flames, there is no hope for those on the plane. It was fairly obvious to firefighters that no one could survive the incident. Well, when you get a several ton aeroplane full of fuel hitting a building, that's kind of like a bomb. It would have been instant fatality for everybody. There would be no, uh, nothing but just immediate obliteration. What a terrifying way to die, being trapped in the cabin of the plane, knowing that there's no other option that you're going to crash, and particularly from these four people who um, were guests from overseas in a totally remote place. It really is a terrible tragedy. It was pretty compacted, like it definitely smashed into the ground. They were probably dead on impact, um, which I guess was in some way a, a bit of a blessing in that regard. As the small plane was consumed in the fire, the four wives of the golfing friends on board were enjoying a relaxing morning at the Park Hyde Hotel in central Melbourne preparing for a girl's day out. The crash happened right on peak hour as many people thick black plumes of smoke. The air taken off for King Island exploded into a fireball. They did see on the news that there had been an, an accident and it was had stopped traffic on the freeway. Dread started to set in, I'm sure, soon after that because they could not reach their husbands. They could not uh, find anything out and they just knew something was very wrong. Still unsure of what has happened, the four women seek solace in a nearby church, St. Patrick's Cathedral. Surely our parish secretary answered the door and there were some very distressed women there, Americans, and they explained that they believed their husbands were in the plane crash. They had contacted the police already to find, try and find out details, but they'd not been able to, obviously, as the police didn't yet know who the victims of the crash were. I think when people are you know, absolutely knocked down, you try to lift the horizon. It's the candles. It's the proclamation of the word of God. It's even the light, there's that beautiful golden light. Eventually the hotel rang to say the police had arrived and by that stage they had identified the plane and the passenger list. I took them back over to the hotel and the hotel had a room. And the police broke the news to them very gently and with great empathy. Understandably, they were in great distress. Across Melbourne, police also break the tragic news to Scylla Quatermain, pilot Max Quatermain's devoted wife. The ambulance turned up. 
in case I went into shock. The police and everyone else that came to my place, they kept the TV and the radio off, so I, I didn't see that footage for a couple of days. And when I did, it was very traumatic, very traumatic to think that my husband, the pilot, has, this is him, you know, in having this major horrific accident. It was um, tough to watch, so didn't really see any more. <laughs> Greg's wife had called Greg's daughter to let her know tragically what had happened to her dad. And then she called me. They called me Aunt Denny. She goes, I'm, I'm so sorry, Aunt Denny. I'm so sorry. And I, I was like, to her, no, this is your dad. You know, it's one thing for, for it to be my brother, but this is your dad. To put the family's minds at rest, it is now up to safety investigators to sift through the charred wreckage for clues. Pilot error, a catastrophic malfunction with the aircraft, or something else entirely. As word spread quickly through the aviation community, there was one team tasked with trying to make sense of the disaster, the ATSB, or Australian Transport Safety Bureau. The first words I heard was that a King Air aircraft had collided with a building near Essendon Airport. We were basically on the next flight out of Canberra. It was a wreckage scene that I'd never seen before, so it was quite confronting um, what we initially saw. The most important thing when we arrive at the site are to gather perishable evidence. It's important for us to access any recording devices. We look for any defects in the wreckage that remains. What was the position of the flight controls, the landing gear? And it's also important for us to talk to eyewitnesses. They noted there was a pronounced left yaw where it turns to the left. It led us to think that it's possible, being a twin-engine aircraft, if there's a fault with one of the engines, that that would induce a yaw in the aircraft. The yaw, or severe pull to the left, which ended with a fiery crash into the DFO, would prove crucial evidence. On the roof of the building, we found some propeller slash marks where the propeller blades had cut through the roofing material. We were able to analyse the dash cam footage and determine that both engines were operating normally when the aircraft collided with the building. The investigation moved on to the crucial cockpit voice recorder, holding the key to the last moments of speech and sound for passengers and pilot. The fire-damaged cockpit voice recorder was removed from the wreckage and transported back to the ATSB laboratories in Canberra. The cockpit voice recorder was downloaded. In a bizarre twist, the flight recorder was turned off. What was recorded was a flight the previous month and the cockpit voice recorder hadn't been functioning since then. We started looking more closely at the flight controls. We looked at the rudder system and the rudder trim tab system and we were able to identify some abrasion marks that indicated that the rudder trim tab was in the nose left position when it collided with the building. Beginning with the flight of the day of the crash, Mr Quartermain was observed walking to his aeroplane. What you normally do is, as you approach the aeroplane, you keep an eye out for things like deflated tyres or 
oil leaks or fuel leaks. Just a general uh, wide-ranging inspection. In the moments before he took off, during his pre-flight inspection, Max Quatermain didn't notice the rudder trim of the aircraft. Instead of being in a central position for takeoff, it was turned hard to the left. Once in the cockpit with his passengers buckled up and ready to go, Quatermain failed to notice that the rudder trim wheel was also completely wrong. Checklists are essential for every phase of the flight, for every flight you do. Always certain essential items are verified using the checklist. You cannot really operate without a checklist. As he's rolling down the runway, because of the trim being set in the full left position, he would have felt a tendency, the airplane wanting to uh, veer off to the left. The passengers would have become aware once the aircraft suddenly yawed and was side slipping along. I also would have been concerned at the low angle of climb and the fact the undercarriage didn't retract. They would have been aware something was seriously wrong when the aeroplane started to descend from 45 metres. From the moment of liftoff, Max Quatermain had just 10 seconds to figure it out. Tragically, he didn't. The pilot issued a mayday call seven times in rapid succession. The 2017 Essendon Airport plane crash was the worst civil aviation incident in Victoria in 30 years. For this kind of thing that happened in Australia is quite shocking, really, considering we're the most aviation-regulated country in the world. It wasn't until more than five years after the accident that the Victorian coroner brought down his findings. The rudder trim in the wrong position caused the deaths of Max Quatermain and his passengers. I sort of possibly believe it could have been an oversight. But he would have tried so hard to keep that plane in the air. Max would have done everything in his power because that's the sort of person he was. The coroner recommended that CASA require more diligent testing of older pilots and that the rudder trim must be checked more than once during a pre-flight checklist. Given his physical and mental health, he should never have been flying anyway. For Scylla, the loss has been devastating. The last six years have been very traumatic. I was um, suffering severe depression. I was suicidal. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to survive. And I miss his love, his company, his smart wit. But that's gone and the memories are all in my heart. It would have been horrific for Max and those passengers. Horrific. The uh, saddest thing of uh, this whole tragic episode is that these gentlemen were retired professional gentlemen who were coming with their wives for a holiday in Australia and so looking forward to it, so enjoying it, and look at the tragedy that occurred. I hope that they all didn't suffer. I felt for the wives 
I know everyone grieves differently, but I know what they would have been going through. In Minnesota, Danelle's grieving is often comforted by the thought that her brother Greg sought strength in his faith. That's what he did in his final moments, was, was reach out to Jesus Christ and, and be taken. Oh. But Danelle also grapples with the doubly cruel blow dealt to her brother's loved ones by his death. When my brother was close to six years old, our father, who was a Marine Corps fighter pilot, was doing maneuvers by the base that we lived on and uh, the plane crashed. His body was never found and he was tragically gone. For our dad to die in a plane crash like that and then to lose my brother that way. It was hard. <laughs>